Rock United Methodist Church, a place of love and grace, of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be a part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. If you are worshiping with us from home this morning, will you please let us know by dropping a comment or hitting one of the emoji buttons. For those in the sanctuary, we will have an extended time to greet each other following our worship service today. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Throughout the season of Advent, we waited in the rich darkness of winter, in the heart of all that is unknown, all that troubles, all that is still unsettled. Christ was born. With joy we welcomed Emmanuel, God with us. As the light of Christ is lit, we remember that incarnation is an ever unfolding promise. God's presence is still being born among us today. Please join us in our call to worship. Hear what God says about those who strive to walk in the way of discipleship. The righteous flourish like the lush palm tree and are strong like the cedar. We are like trees planted near a steady source of water with green leaves and good fruit. Our fruit is love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God, as we come together on this day of worship, may we flourish and bear good fruit. Let us pray. Lord, transform us, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the world. Do your work in us, molding us, making us, shaping us, changing us to be the new creation you have called us to be in Jesus Christ. Do your work in our church. Help us to be the body of Christ engaged in mission, testifying to the power of our faith, witnessing to the presence of our living and loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us surrender the church back to you. It is yours, not ours. Let us lay aside our personal agendas and preferences so we can be fully committed to your calling for us. Do your work in our world. Give to us a vision of transformed lives, neighborhoods, and communities, and how we can partner with you to see what can happen when people of faith make an eternal difference, living and loving like Jesus and giving themselves fully heart, mind, and strength, to be the very presence of Jesus Christ in our world, bringing blessings and redemption for the glory of God. Amen. Can you believe we are in the last session of this worship series, Never the Same? It seemed to fly by for me. I don't know about you. But we began our series with the story of the Magi who followed, they were guided by a star. They followed the star to find the baby Jesus. And they encountered Jesus and then they went home a different way. In our scripture reading from Paul to the Galatians, he implores them to be guided by the Spirit. And that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we've dug into each of those attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. We explored God's love, agape. And we know that that's the first on the list. Because the ones that come after that are concrete ways to love. So we've explored joy, that sense of contentment no matter what. We explored peace. And we know that peace is not just the absence of violence or confusion. It 
is about the wholeness and the well-being of others, of all others. It's when justice prevails. We've explored patience as a posture, a posture of endurance, of exercising restraint instead of revenge. We've explored kindness. Again, a posture where we soften our edges, where we don't require people to be exactly like us or believe exactly like us. We've explored goodness, which is active in doing good deeds. It's not just enough to think about doing, it's about the doing. We, we explored faithfulness, which was the personification of good faith, trust, and reliability. And in scripture, we found that it was used to describe both the trustworthy and those believing in Jesus Christ. So today, we have our final two attributes. Today, we will explore gentleness and self-control. So I invite you, as Jimmy reads the scripture today from both the Old Testament, actually, they're both New Testament. I thought we might have an old one. That's next week. I'm already in next week. I don't know what to tell you. Two of our scripture readings today from the New Testament. Listen for how these are all woven together. Listen, because it's pretty hard to pull them apart, right? This is a fabric, a fabric of love that we're talking about. So hear these words. Our first reading is found in the New Testament, found in Titus. Please turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready to do for every good work, to speak evil to of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. So the sins are reading for Titus. Please stand, stand and join the singing, I am on the Lord. So number 319, you remember the word of God.
true. Self-control, though, I may get a little light of it. But you are supposed to be able to go, okay, that's enough. So let me spin it another way. Which of you guys like YouTube? Who has the favorite video person they follow? I don't know the right names anymore. Who sits on here and likes TikTok, even though we're not supposed to talk, but we actually have TikTok accounts. That's okay. I like mine too. I'm not going to lie. Too old for it, but I love it. Who likes to play on their game systems? Okay. So how many of you, though, when we say, guys, it's time to get off of those, can you please come do fill in the blank? I need five more minutes. Yeah, we'll give you five. But then it's an hour later. <laughs> and we're like, okay, guys. We want you to have fun. You can have a balance of having a good time. But the self-control is going, no more Pringles. No more pendants. No more games. No more legs. Thank you, Henry. It's being able to see past that you want it. Now we can want all of these things. We can want all that game time, that YouTube time. We can want all of that free time. But God doesn't want us to just overindulge. And if we are going to do a little bit of overindulgence, do it on behalf of Him. When you're balancing out wanting that game system, that YouTube, these Wonderful commercialized chips. Ladies, thank you for plugging them on Super Bowl Sunday. What he really wants to know is, did you take time to speak to me? Did you prioritize prayer? Did you indulge in reading the Bible? Did you take a moment, that extra five, and instead of playing the game, did you pray for someone? Self-control is wanting it and knowing when to stop doing it. Because sometimes it's not a good means of doing it. And all self-control is not like bad, horrible things. It really is the enjoyable things. It's going, nope, I can stop with four minutes this morning. Nope, I only need 20 minutes on that game. I have other things I should do, supposed to do, could do, would do, will do. And in God, that exact same thing needs to be followed. He granted you that human free will. He gave you free choice. He also asked of you to have some self-control. Don't overindulge in the things that you want to. Maybe you overindulge in the things you need to. Prayer, time with him time spent doing it for him. Nobody's ever going to tell you that you don't need to go out and help the world solve a problem like spending time with those in need. Sharing those smiles that we keep repeating. You can overindulge in smiling to a person that needs a smile. So, I hope you enjoy the chips. You're allowed. You're supposed to enjoy them. But I hope you do know that you have to learn how to have some self-control. Are we good with that idea? All right, so here's my thing. I know my kid will play those. Would you guys like to enjoy the rest of these? <laughs> Beautiful. I love you, parents. And <laughs> 10 minutes. A 10 minutes? There you go, girlfriend. Thank you, my lovies. You need to live. I'm so sorry. She'll look cute with this.
So gentleness. Gentleness and self-control. Gentleness, the Greek word is praeotius. Praeotius. I've had to pronounce that, practice that a lot. Sometimes this word is translated as gentleness, and sometimes it is translated as meekness. This word, this attribute, does not denote an outward expression of feeling, but it's an inward grace of soul. It's a calmness toward God in particular. It's an acceptance of God's dealings with us, considering them as good in that they enhance our closeness, that they enhance our relationship with God. Now, Jesus was described as meek. Would you say Jesus was weak? No. No? <coughs> so meekness does not equal weakness. In fact, the Greek word encompasses expressing wrath toward the sin of humanity, toward injustice. And in fact, Aristotle said that praetis is the virtue that stands between two extremes. Uncontrolled and unjustified anger on one hand, or one extreme, and not becoming angry at all, no matter what takes place around us, is the other extreme. Now Jesus was meek. Right? Jesus was described as meek. And Jesus was righteously angry multiple times in Scripture. Most famously was when he became angry at the, in, at the temple. Because at the temple, religious profiteers were exploiting people. There was injustice happening on a regular basis. The money changers were cheating the ordinary people. Jesus made a whip and he overturned tables. Jesus was meek. Also translated to gentleness. But you see, that's not the only time that we see Jesus become angry in the Gospels. One particular Sabbath at the synagogue, Jesus became deeply distressed. So I want you to think about that phrase, deeply distressed at the stubborn hearts of the Pharisees, and he looked around them in anger when they were against him healing on the Sabbath, when he invited the man who had the crippled arm to stretch out his arm. Jesus also became indignant with his own disciples when they prevented the children from coming to him. He rebuked them. You can see, language is a funny thing, right? Deeply distressed, rebuked, righteous anger. Are we getting a theme here? These expressions of anger from Jesus should not shock us. If we're paying, if we were paying attention to God's anger in the Old Testament, the psalmists often appeal to God's anger as their only hope against injustice, pleading with God to feel the pain of their injustice and to respond with judgment. This meekness does not blame God for the injustices, the evil doings of humanity. This meekness is a righteous anger for injustice. So I ask you, where do we see injustice in our own world, in our town, in our community? Who is the world telling you not to love? Who is the world telling you you need to be suspicious of these people or of those people? That it's okay to treat them as less than human. It was a couple years ago 
at Camp Joy that our group was with another group from Gaithersburg. And our groups looked vastly different. Our group was primarily white. And their group was primarily a group made up of persons of color. And the two groups came here for dinner. That marvelous taco dinner, right? We love taco dinner at Hancock United Methodist Church. I think it's the best dinner for the entire Camp Joy Week. I'm a little biased, but but that's what the kids tell me. Anyway, the kids had had dinner. They finished up, and some of the kids from the other church went outside. They had not been in a small town. They were from a city environment. And they were standing just across the street at Joseph Hancock Park. You know where the little indentation is and the little benches are right there? And they were just kind of looking up and down Main Street. They were waiting for their leaders to come out so that they could all pile in their cars and go back to Camp Harmison. And what those kids experienced broke my heart. You see, there was somebody across the street that saw a group of children whose skin was not lily white. And they started filming them. The kids standing there. It's a new place. What is this thing called a town in Western Maryland? So who has the world taught us to be suspicious of? And to treat as less than? I have a friend from seminary, and Cornell is my age. He grew up about 20 miles from where I was born and raised. And his mom and my mom are the same age. Now, Cornell is a black man, and I'm a white woman. Our life experiences have been very different. But the thing that we have in common we have a lot of things in common, but this particular thing, we discovered during a class on systematic theology. And in that class, we were talking about systemic evil. And we talked about the experiences our mothers had growing up in the era of Jim Crow laws. My mother was in seventh grade when the schools were integrated. And there were many conversations about different ways people were treated, right? And my mom would say, that's just the way it was. You see, the thing that Cornell and I had in common is when he would ask his mom about how things were, she would say, it's just the way things were. Let me suggest to you that just because it's the way they were doesn't make it right. Does not make it righteous in God's eyes. Cornell has done a lot of work on reconciliation and racism. Coming at it from the lens, a theological lens, right? Racism is a sin. So he's done his thesis, he's doing some workshops, he's got some stuff going on. But I received a call from him just a couple weeks ago. And I had read his thesis, and it was geared primarily toward the black church. And his question to me was, Becky, how do I bring this to white churches? Well, let's talk about that. Because you see, while we have some things in common, our experiences are different. So how do we tackle the tough question of racism? How do we tackle it in a way that leads to reconciliation and healing? Not to defensiveness 
or it's not my problem, or it's just the way it is syndrome. So I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like. I'm working with him on some of our, our conversations and that sort of thing. But again, this is where the Spirit has led me. So all I'm going to say to you is stay tuned because I would venture to say that we will probably have some conversations around this about our own context here. What do we see? And what can we do? Where are we in this? Let me ask you this. I use the phrase, Jesus was deeply distressed. What deeply distresses you? I've shared with you something that distresses me. But what deeply distresses you? What hurts your heart? What injustice out there makes you want to cry? What makes you righteously angry? Angry on behalf of others. Angry because you see the injustice taking place and perhaps feel helpless because it's just the way it is. I'm pretty sure that none of us thought of gentleness and neatness in this way before. That we never thought of gentleness as the virtue that stands between the two extremes, the uncontrolled, unjustified anger, and the not becoming angry at all, no matter what takes place around us. I'm curious. Who drew the star of gentleness? That's my star, too. So maybe that's why the Spirit had me up at 3 o'clock, changing what I had originally written. (laughs) So, let's move on to self-control. We humans suffer from a failure of will and self-control, and Gala did a great job of illustrating that with snacks. And if I'm honest, I've already had two boxes of Samoas, and I'm really trying hard to resist ordering more. (laughs) The Greeks call this failure of will and self-control a crazia. So I'm like, ah, it's kind of crazy, right? A crazia. It translates to lacking command because of the tendency human brains is to place a higher value on immediate rewards than future rewards. We often fall victim to that lack of control. In fact, how many of you hit the snooze button this morning? Because that instant gratification of more sleep is more important in the moment than having time to take a shower drive the speed limit to get to church on time. This acrasia, this lack of control, is what keeps us chasing the next high without thinking about the consequences. That high could come from reckless behavior, adrenaline-based behavior, or something other. It's the more, 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 now, now, now. It is self-indulgent and it's excess. So self-control, the final attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, has been translated from the Greek word inkratia, which is described as strength, especially in mastering one's thoughts and behavior. To have power over one's own passions and instincts. So if that instinct is to hit the snooze button, self-control is having mastering and having power over one's own instincts. Self-control is about being moderate and not getting into indulgence or excess. It is a contentedness or sufficiency. It's the opposite of only focusing on immediate. 
So back in the 1980s, the law, banking laws changed. And all of a sudden, credit card companies could now issue credit to 18-year-olds. College campuses were covered with applications. You've been pre-approved for $2,000. What college student in the 80s even had 20 bucks in their pocket, let alone $2,000? The immediate gratification, you just use this card. You can, you can have that pair of shoes. You can have the skirt, the jacket. Hey, you can go out, you can get pizza, and whatever other snacks you want. Just keep bringing that card up. Keep bringing it up. It's instant gratification. Until it's not. Until you're overcome debt. Debt that you're now buried under. So you see, for me, self-control goes into how I manage my money, right? So now, much wiser, a little bit stronger, a little bit more in control of myself, I save for an item. There's a pair of boots somewhere. Do I have the cash in my, in my checking account? If I do, then I can get it. If I don't, guess what? I gotta wait. That benefit, that later benefit, is what becomes more important than the instant gratification. Self-control shows up in all aspects of our lives, in all aspects of our behavior. And I suggest that it's not something we do on our own. You see, the Holy Spirit has been poured out onto us richly through Jesus Christ. We read that in the scripture today. So, the self-control, the gentleness, the patience, the joy, the love, the, all of the different attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. We can't do any of that on our own. It is through the Spirit of Jesus Christ in us that we are able to live lives with self-control, with gentleness, with patience, with kindness, meekness. I pray that you have been as blessed by this series as I have. Jean and I were talking this morning about this, and I said, you know, as we've tried to pull these attributes apart, we realize how closely they are woven together. So even if you've drawn one star word, but another one has resonated with you, that's okay. Because they're all fruit of the Spirit together. Let us as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe ourselves with the fruit of the Spirit. Will you say them with me? Let us clothe ourselves with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I look forward as the year unfolds to hear more about how being guided by the Spirit, our lives are transformed and how we are never the same. Amen? Amen. You are invited to stand as we sing Spirit of the Living God. It's number 393 in the hymnus. Now, footnote. There's only one verse in the hymnal. But we're singing two verses. So you got to look for the words for the second verse on the screen. Because our hymnal only has one verse. But the second verse was just too good to leave out today. <laughs>
join me in our affirmation of faith, which is found on page 885 of your hymnal. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in our example of our blessed Lord. To the end, the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. We invite the Holy Spirit into our efforts. <laughs> we invite the Holy Spirit into our efforts to sow seeds in faith. May we be empowered with the knowledge that our giving is not a transaction, but an act of trust in God's unfailing promises. You're invited to place your offering in the box at the back of the church. If you missed placing your offering in the box, there will be one there for you to use as you leave today. For those of you worshiping with us from home, your offering may be nailed in or given electronically using our website. Let us now gather our gifts together and offer them in gratitude and praise to the one who gave his whole self for our redemption.
praises and their joy. Surely we've had some joy this week, folks. Roger. I had the joy of taking my wife out on a date last night, uh, pre-Halloween, uh, pre-Halloween show. <laughs> We didn't get dressed up. Oh, yeah. We didn't wear nice clothes. So we celebrate the joy of your relationship. The joy of being able to go out together and spend time together. I have a praise. I received Anaya's birth certificate last Saturday, and I just applied for her social security card. And that is it. We're done. It's two minutes. <laughs> so we just had praise at all the red cases at almost at the end it's for official. all of the officials <laughs> to make Anaya yours. That's right. <laughs> what are those things that are weighing on us that deeply disturb us, that cause us grief or pain or anger? What are those things that we need to lift to God today? Becky and my sister Nancy um, has gangrene in her feet. She's probably going to lose a couple toes, and we're not sure how far it's going. She's on dialysis. So, so Bonnie, we lift your sister Nancy mm -hmm. for God's healing touch. Keep Polly Barker in your prayers that she lost her husband Thursday on her birthday. So we do lift Polly and her family as they grieve the loss of Dick. Um, I got to spend some time with her, and um, what she said is, this is going to be hard. This is going to be hard. So let's surround her in love, surround her, be there when she wants you to be there, and give her a little space when she wants a little space. Junior Moats family. The family of Junior Moats, who are also grieving. We lift... Margaret Weller, who is also hospitalized. And we pray for those who are battling cancer. We have many on our prayer list. And they are all in varying stages of, of their battles. The leaders of our country. We lift our, the leaders of our country. I have a friend. Um, lives in Pittsburgh, and he's struggling with his brother who's dying of cancer, and his mother uh, has dementia and cannot live on her own, and he's having trouble making that happen with his mother. So. What's his name? His name is Paul. So we lift Paul and all of the caregivers who are sandwiched between either caring for children and grandchildren or parents or spouses or whatever the situation may be. Caregiving is hard. So we lift the caregivers. Um, Keith Marshall, he had, a prayer. he had a setback this week. He had a blood clot that they're trying to dissolve before they could ever send him to a rehab center. So he's set back probably a week or so ago. So we continue to lift Marshall Hill. Brody? My brother Buck Stone broke his arm last Friday. A year ago he broke his hip. He's not a happy camper. Oh, no, I would imagine not. So Brody, we lift Buck. As he heals from his broken arm. Other prayers. Other concerns. We lift to, those, lift to God those who are sick. We have several that are not with us today. Um, Betsy is not here. Um, she is homesick. We lift Dan and Debbie who are also homesick. There's a lot of the, the creepy crud going on, so we lift all of those who are battling illness and sickness. Let us, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your presence among us. We give you praise and thanksgiving for new life. We give you praise and thanksgiving for this community of faith. We praise you, God, for your love that never ends. God, we've lifted many today by name. Those that mourn, give them comfort. Those that are sick, be it in body, mind, or spirit, we pray your healing for full restoration. For those who are leading and guiding communities, States, nations.
nations. Be with them, God. Guide them. Let your fruit, let your spirit fill them so that your fruit may be evident. God, we lift our brothers and sisters in this parish, the people of Catalpa and Piney Plains United Methodist Churches, that together we can be your hands and feet in the communities in which we reside. And together, let us pray in the words that Jesus gave his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we have a lot of announcements today. It's a busy time of the year. Today, right after church, we will be packing boxes for our college students. So if you have time and you want to stay and help, Polly is leading the charge on that. And uh, we will be packing in the primary area. <coughs> if you can't stay, but take a moment and sign a Valentine card for each of the kids. The table's still out there and there's still some cards um, that we're going to put in the boxes. Uh, so, Lent is here, folks. It starts on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. So, Tuesday is Shrove Tuesday. We will be having an amazing pancake supper from 5 to 7 in the upper room. I know that um, Nicole told me she is still in need of folks to help flip pancakes. And if you have an electric griddle, that would be incredibly helpful. If you have a griddle and you're not able to be here, but you could loan that to the crew that would be working, that would be helpful as well. But I hope you're able to come at some point and get some yummy, yummy uh, breakfast for dinner, right? Breakfast for dinner. And I'm told that Carl's going to be making the sausage gravy. So, come for dinner. And then on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we will meet here in the sanctuary at 6.30 for a parish-wide worship service that includes the imposition of ashes as we begin our Lenten season and our Lenten series, which is titled Good Enough. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have table worship. And I'm excited about this month's table worship. The topic is elderhood. We kind of understand childhood. We understand adulthood, kind of. <laughs> but this thing called elderhood, we're going to dive into that and explore that. And I know Nancy's um, been doing a lot of good work with that, and I'm excited to see what that looks like. On Saturday... We've got a couple things going on Saturday. Hope House in Berkeley Springs, the women's shelter for those that women that are homeless. They're having an open house from 8 to 4.30. You are invited to pop in, meet the staff, meet the ladies, see the facility. And if God draws your heart to service for the homeless, this would be a great place to plug in because it is literally just across the river. It's a short jaunt. The new member class will also be Saturday. That's going the 24th from 9 to noon. And then the young adults. I'm thrilled about this. There's going to be a young adult hangout at Locust Post Brewery to have do a thing called Pub Theology. It is a family-friendly facility, so 18 years and older are welcome to join us as we have conversation about who is God to you? What does that look like in your life? So the conversations 
are theological in nature as we sit around the tables and um, have the conversation and then they also have a whole bunch of games there so I'm told that they'll probably pull out some games and play games too. So That is on the 24th from at 1 o'clock. I don't think that showed up very well. Um, Easter flowers orders are due on the 25th and we will also be having a hospitality team meeting right after church on the 25th. So, oh, and see, there's still more. Wait, there's still more. March 2nd, for those of you that have done work with the Firewood Ministry, mark your calendars. March 2nd, we're going to do, we're going to go out to Miss Bonnie's because she has some trees taken down and we're going to do some cutting and splitting right on her property. And then, oh, Gary? Just if, if you feel moved to help with that, please let me or the pastor know because we are not going to get out and tackle that job with less than eight people. And I'd really like to have 10 or 12 because we have to move wood, chunks of wood, the whole way around her trailer down to one of the few level spots where it can be split and stacked. And some of us are in elderhood. <laughs> and right now, I mean, Connie has committed. Dean, of course, will help with his splitter. I'll be there. But we really need to have commitments from eight or ten people before we take this on because it's just going to be a whole lot of rolling and carrying stuff around for part of it. Okay, so you guys heard the plea. We really, really, really need a lot of hands for the firewood ministry with Miss Bonnie's. All right, I'm gonna kind of throw Tracy on the spot a little bit, or maybe Robin, or maybe I'll just have you guys raise your hands. Okay, Easter egg hunt coming up March 23rd. Robin and Tracy are coordinating that, so I'm sure we will have more. To come about it, mark your calendars because this season is a busy season. Um, it will be out at Widmeyer Park um, in the early afternoon. So more details will be coming on that. And then the youth met yesterday to talk about Camp Joy, which is in July. But guess what? The planning has already started. And the important thing that we are asking you to do is undergird that ministry in prayer. Spread the word. We have homeowner applications that are available. You may know someone who lives near you, or maybe they don't live near you, but you may know someone who could benefit from help in doing some home repairs. So please help us spread the word. And if you are led, there are many, many places that you can serve, and there will be more coming on that. So those are all of the announcements. I told you there was a lot of announcements today because we are entering a very busy season in our church life. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
heart. Let us spread that far and wide. May the light of the star, the light of God's gentleness and self-control shine before you as you leave this place. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love to meet God's people in the world and greet them with the good news of salvation. Amen.